Hey everybody, welcome to Money's No Object. I'm your host, Dylan Howell. This is episode number 432 of our YouTube channel and podcast, and I cannot be more excited to continue sharing with you guys personal finance topics that I think could be useful for you in your long-term financial journey. Today, we are going to be talking about um, a fact of investing that many of you do not like to hear, uh, and that's that beating the market is hard, right? Uh, and maybe being an index fund investor uh, is the way that you should go. I know nobody likes to hear that. I know that takes the fun out of it or whatever, right? Uh, but it is 100% true. And I'm going to make uh, a good argument as to why that is uh, today. I'll also talk about the truth of what I do with my own money uh, and you know why you can see this actually play out uh, in the way I invest, the way I put money away, uh, and the way uh, that my returns have um you know, ultimately panned out over uh, my investing life so far. So stick around for a discussion of all that and more in today's episode. Before we get started, though, if you could go down below, hit the big red subscribe button, like this video, leave me any feedback in the comments down below, and I'll be sure to respond to anything you leave down there. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify podcasts, be sure to subscribe and leave me a review on either one of those platforms. Follow me on social media at MNO with Dylan. And that's really good supplemental materials to all the things I'm putting out in these long form episodes on YouTube and the podcast every single day. Then if you need somebody to help you to build a financial plan and keep you accountable to that plan over the long term, then I can do that. Just DM me on any of the major social media sites and tell me that you are interested in financial coaching sessions and you and I can begin working together, pushing towards your long-term financial goals and ultimately pushing you on towards long-term financial freedom, which is what I hope for every single individual who's watching or listening to the show on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, let me just start you off with a little anecdote, right? And uh, this is going to be me making a case uh, for the... Um, argument that, that uh, we're making in today's episode, which is that uh, you know, you're just better off buying an index fund, right? And many of you have probably heard uh, this anecdote before. Many of you have probably heard this story uh, and what happened. But for those of you who haven't, uh, buckle up because I'm going to uh, take you on a little ride through a bet made by uh, none other than Warren Buffett, right? Uh, so here's the story. In 2008, uh, Warren Buffett issued a challenge to the hedge fund industry, uh, which in his view charged exorbitant fees uh, that the fund's performances could not justify. Uh, Prodigy Partners LLC accepted and the two parties placed a million dollar bet. Now let's just stop real quick. Uh, he talks about uh, the exorbitant fees that are charged by hedge funds. Now, many of you and uh, myself, we don't have access uh, to hedge funds like many of the wealthier individuals do. Uh, but that said, the hedge fund industry has historically charged huge fees. They typically charge 2% of assets under management. So that's just a 2% uh, fee that you're going to pay every single year period. Uh, then 20% uh, of all gains. So they call it 2 and 20 uh, that they typically charge, which is way more than you would typically be charged by any investment advisor uh, or you know somebody who's going to allow you to do uh, more traditional types of investing. Now, let's jump back into this. Buffett has won the bet, um, and the Prodigy co-founder, um, he uh, left the fund in 2015, conceded defeat ahead of the contest scheduled wrap-up on December 31st, 2017, writing, for all intents and purposes, the game is over, I lost. Now, Buffett's ultimate success was based on fees, costs, expenses, and the fact that the S&P 500 just outperformed uh, a hand-picked portfolio of hedge funds over 10 years. Uh, the bet pit two basic investing philosophies against each other, passive and active investing. And so uh, index funds are your passive investing, right? They are the investing uh, where you are just you know putting money away into this diversified group of companies over a long period of time um, and just expecting to get the market return while active investing is trying to find uh, the best returns in whatever securities that you're investing in at any given time. Now, Buffett may be the quintessential active investor himself, uh, but clearly does not think that anyone else should try. So uh, if you know anything about Warren Buffett and how he made uh, the money that he has, it was through investing in companies, right? Uh, buying large stakes in companies, buying stocks, um, known as the Oracle of Omaha for his ability uh, to, you know, foresee the future of companies and buy 
uh, great companies and buy uh, great stocks. Now, he said as much in his uh, letter to shareholders in 2017, um, you know, via Berkshire Hathaway, which is the company that he's the chairman and CEO of, he boasted that there was, quote, no doubt who would come out on top uh, when the contest ended. Uh, his victory didn't always seem so certain, though. Not long after the wager started, on January 1st, 2008, the market tanked, and the hedge funds were able to show off their strong suit, which is hedging. And if you don't know what hedging is, uh, hedging is basically this idea uh, of um, lacking correlation of returns. So basically, uh, decreasing risk, um, or sometimes they call it hedging your risk, right? You, you decrease uh, the amount of risk that you're taking by investing in assets that are not highly correlated with one another. So don't move all in the same direction at the same time. So they invested in things that while the market uh, was tanking, uh, were either you know gaining in value or uh, staying more stable in value than the, the stock market itself was. So Buffett's index fund lost 37% of its value compared to the hedge funds 23.9%. Uh, during that time. And Buffett then beat Prodigy in every year from 2009 through 2014, but it took four years to pull ahead of the hedge funds in terms of cumulative return. And so what that teaches us is that if you take early losses, it's very hard to make up uh, for those losses. So just for instance, if you take uh, a loss of, let's say, 50%, right? You lose half your money uh, on something. What does your return need to be from that point in order to get back just to where you were? It needs to be 100%, right? Uh, so the returns you have to make once you've already dug this deep hole for yourself have to be quite large. And he, he did dig out of that hole in the, in the index fund and then uh, ultimately surpassed uh, the hedge fund. So in 2015, uh, Buffett lagged his hedge fund rival for the first time since 2008, gaining 1.4% uh, versus Prodigy's 1.7, but 2016 saw Buffett gain 11.9% to Prodigy's 0.9%. Another downturn uh, could conceivably have handed the advantage back to Prodigy, but that didn't happen. At the end of 2016, Buffett's index fund uh, bet gained 7.1% per year, uh, or $854,000 in total, uh, compared to 2.2% per year uh, for Prodigy's picks, just $220,000 in total. So um, from 2008 through 2016, um, the hedge fund average uh, was a 22% cumulative return, uh, where the index fund average was um, an 85.4% cumulative return, with the best hedge fund making 62.8% over that time and the worst hedge fund making 2.9%. And it was uh, five funds that they chose. Now, in his shareholder letter, Buffett said that uh, he believed the hedge fund managers involved in the bet were honest and intelligent people, but added that the results for the investors were really, really dismal. Uh, and he noted that the 2 and 20 fee structure, which I uh, noted earlier, generally adopted by hedge funds, means that managers were showered with compensation, despite, often enough, uh, providing only uh, esoteric gibberish in return, is uh, what he said. So in the end, uh, the CEO of uh, Prodigy admitted the strength of Buffett's argument. He's correct that the hedge fund fees are high and his reasoning is convincing. Fees matter in investing, no doubt about it. The index fund Buffett chose uh, charged an expense ratio of just 0.04%, according to Morningstar. Uh, and then obviously the hedge funds were charging 2 and 20, which is far, far higher. Now, in his letter, uh, Buffett estimated that the financial elites had wasted $100 billion or more over the past decade by refusing to settle for low-cost index funds, but pointed out that the harm was not limited to one percenters. State pension plans have invested with, it, with hedge funds, and the resulting shortfalls in their assets uh, will, for decades, uh, have to be made up by local taxpayers. Uh, Buffett also floated the idea of erecting a statue of the index funds investor, uh, Jack Bogle, the, um, the uh, founder of the Vanguard Group. So, Ultimately, we, we hear this story, and the story really is this. The story is uh, that index funds win, right? Uh, that lower cost investing, simpler investing uh, wins over, in this case, a 10-year period. Now, has it won in every single 10-year period ever? No, right? It uh, just has not happened. But uh, if you look over long, long, long periods of time, uh, the compounded rate of return difference is going to be quite high, which brings me to this argument, right? This argument is you're probably better off buying an index fund. 
All right, most of you who are trying to get off uh, of the ground when it comes to investing, you're trying to learn about investing, you're trying to get started, um, and you're just overwhelmed with all of the options, you're overwhelmed with the choices, you're overwhelmed with the jargon, right? You're overwhelmed with the words that are spoken to you by advisors and by salespeople and all these types of things, when ultimately you're probably just better off buying an index fund. So if you own an investment fund that is actively managed, right? Uh, odds are that your returns lagged, let's just say last year, right? Those chances are even worse over a multi-year time frame. Right. Generally, you have seen in mutual funds and ETFs, active uh, mutual funds, active ETFs have underperformed uh, their passive counterparts. Now, in actively managed funds, a fund manager selects you know the fund stocks and bonds. Uh, the passive strategy doesn't employ active stock picking at all, but instead just tracks an index. And so the most common that we hear all the time is the S&P 500, right? Um, there are several S&P 500 uh, index funds that can be purchased and uh, they are very cheap. They, uh, you know, the S&P 500 is uh, quite diversified, not as diversified as you could ever be because it's large American companies, uh, which gives you a large amount of diversification, but not uh, getting you into smaller companies, not getting you into international stocks quite as much, all those types of things, right? Um, but nonetheless, that's what a uh, passive fund is. Now, the S&P 500, it's a U.S. stock index comprising the biggest companies uh, weighted according to their market capitalization. So basically, the ones that are worth the most in the market are going to have the highest weight uh, on the returns that you make in that index. Now, an index fund aims to replicate its holdings and returns. So all that an index fund is doing, or the manager of an index fund, because all funds have portfolio managers, all that portfolio manager is doing is making sure that the weights of the index fund match up with the weights of the actual index, right? That's their whole job, okay? Uh, that way that the returns will line up. Now, in general, active funds are going to try to not keep up with an index or keep up with uh, the market. They're going to try to beat the market, right? Uh, where the index funds literally are the market. They literally are whatever index uh, that an active manager may be trying to beat. But active managers did not fare well like last year, right? About 80% of all actively managed U.S. mutual funds underperformed their benchmark in 2021, the third worst showing in the past two decades, according to the S&P Dow Jones Indices uh, annual SPIVA report. Uh, it was really quite exceptionally bad, uh, said Craig Lazara, managing director in S&P's core product mark, uh, management group. Certain stock subcategories were worse. About 85% of U.S. large cap stock funds underperformed the S&P 500, uh, the second worst percentage on record. The share was 99% for large cap growth funds relative to their benchmark, which is outrageous. That's crazy, right? Now, a lot of that has to do with the fact that a lot of large cap growth companies, um, you know, got really big and then, you know, fell off quite a bit from uh, their highs. And so uh, the benchmark or the index didn't have any feelings about, uh, you know, those companies falling off of their highs. They were just like, hey, we're just going to hold whatever percentage uh, the index holds. We don't care. Right. Uh, but, you know, obviously an active manager, when there's a lot of selling and there's a lot of losses coming, they're going to feel the need to do something. And ultimately that doing something tends to cost them. So 99 percent of the active managers for large cap growth funds uh, lost relative to uh, the benchmark. Now, however, there were some exceptions, particularly among bond funds. Ten out of 14 bond categories beat their benchmarks. Uh, in 2021, according to the S&P report, meaning more than half of the funds in those categories beat their benchmarks. However, the results aren't as good over longer time frames. Uh, just four bond categories outperformed over a 10-year period uh, and none over 15 years, according to the S&P report. Just 26% of all actively managed funds beat uh, the returns of their index fund rivals over the decade through December 2021, according to a separate report published last month uh, by Morningstar, foreign stock, real estate, and bond funds generally had the highest success rates. Uh, success was lowest for U.S. large cap funds, uh, the reporter said. And let me just give an argument as to why that is, right? The reason that active management can do so good in foreign markets, real estate, bond markets, all those types of things, is because those markets are not near as what we call liquid 
as you know large cap U.S. stocks for uh, example, right? Large cap U.S. stocks, we have a ton of information. There's a ton of trading um, and the ability to make outsized returns uh, is based on your ability to have the right allocation of those stocks at any given time, right? Uh, but if you are trying to make money in you know, international stocks, right? Uh, well, maybe there's less information, less access, uh, less people interested, less liquidity, right? Uh, so actually doing your homework in those foreign companies, uh, you may be able to make outsized returns easier uh, than you would be able to uh, in you know, large U.S. companies. Same can be said about real estate, right? Real estate funds, uh, those portfolio managers can pick specific real estate um, in a more illiquid market uh, that are going to provide higher rates of return than uh, an index might. And then bond funds, very similarly, right? Um, I mean, there's tons and tons of bonds out there, uh, but the trading of bonds is not done uh, near as much as the trading of stocks is done uh, for any given issue. And so finding issues that are going to meet uh, the needs of investors is going to be easier than it is going to be uh, for the large cap funds and being able to make abnormal returns within those investments is also going to be easier. So when you lack liquidity and you lack uh, as much information, then uh, your ability to make outsized returns for these actively managed funds is going to uh, increase. But when there's a lot of information, uh, when there's a lot of interest, a lot of liquidity, a lot of investors, uh, then your ability to go in and outperform the the average, outperform the group as a whole, it's going to be very, very difficult. So as an investor, your presumption should be uh, that passive will beat active always over a long period of time. And if you make that presumption for almost everywhere in the world, asset class and time period, uh, you will be vindicated, right? So even, uh, you know, foreign stocks and real estate and bonds, you just take it over a long period of time and indexes have one. Now, active funds do have certain structural advantage over passive funds, though. For example, by virtue of not having to track an index, managers can sell specific holdings that may become too risky and not just that, um, not, you know, holdings that may become too risky or too large a part of a portfolio, but also um, they can be more tax efficient for you, right? Uh, so an active manager, uh, even though sometimes they can create, you know, unnecessary taxes by doing some selling, uh, they can also sell off lots uh, that are at losses, do some tax loss harvesting, uh, and allow you to decrease your taxable income via the holding of their funds, especially in bad years. Now, many proponents say active funds generally shine in volatile markets. Evidence from the COVID-19 market route suggests otherwise. About half of active funds survived and outperformed their average index rivals in 2020, uh, according to Morningstar. Now, the S&P uh, report statistics uh, are averages which mask broad variation within the actively managed stock and bond categories. Investors who buy an actively managed fund can improve their odds of choosing a winner by buying a lower cost option. And this uh, goes kind of back to the you know Warren Buffett hedge fund argument. It's like, hey, um, the costs are too high. And so even if you made returns that even beat the index marginally, uh, the costs are still going to eat away at returns. And so they're saying here, hey, if you are going to buy an actively managed fund, buy a low cost actively managed fund. So your your probability uh, of beating the market net of fees goes up. Underperformance tends to correlate uh, to higher costs, according to Ben Johnson, a director of global ETF research for Morningstar. Put differently, lower cost funds have greater odds of success. The cheapest active funds outperformed about twice as often as the most expensive expensive ones. So 35% versus 18% in the decade through December 31st, 2021. Fees matter. Uh, they are one of the only reliable predictors of success. Fees are a big reason why index funds typically outperform their actively managed counterparts. The average asset weighted fee for an index fund uh, was 0.12%. Uh, in 2020 versus 0.62 percent for active funds, according to Morningstar, uh, these are annual fees that represent a, per a percentage of the investor's total fund assets. And so that means that the average active fund needs to earn an extra 0.5 percent, which doesn't sound like a lot, uh, but it, when the average on the market um, on a year-by-year -year basis, let's say the S&P 500 is 10 percent, right? If you have an average of 10 percent, uh, what you're telling me there is that somebody's going to have to make 
an extra 5% uh, above that 10% on uh, the returns for, you know, every single year, that's just, that's going to be far more difficult uh, than it may sound, right? So one rule of thumb for investors to follow, an active manager must have 10 years of market beating performance to make a convincing case for skill over luck. Um, and I mean, even so, you can have somebody who's got uh, some skill and that does well over time. Uh, but even if they do really well, the likelihood is that they began uh, that fund when that fund was very small or they took over that fund when that fund was quite small. And word gets out quickly that they outperform and that they're really good managers. So what happens is funds get really big when that happens, right? You know, the Peter Lynch's of the world, even, you know, people investing in Berkshire Hathaway and, you know, the original uh, investment agreement that he had uh, with a bunch of family members and things like that. When you have so much money to invest, uh, it becomes quite difficult to beat the market because now uh, you used to be able to bet on things that were small and that could provide really big returns. But now you can't bet on those small things because you would just buy them up very easily. Right now, you have to make bets on things that are bigger, uh, that people know more about, and that have less of a likelihood of outperforming uh, reliably over long periods of time. So nonetheless, right, um, index funds win over a long period of time. They just do. Uh, and being somebody who, you know, is in the world of finance and that understands um, you know, what these returns look like over a long period of time and uh, who is very interested in picking my own stocks and wants to be able to beat the market and all these types of things. This is a hard pill to swallow, right? Um, there's many times where I, I just feel the need to say that I can do better, right? And there are instances where I have done better, right? But I've taken losses too in individual stocks when uh, the market hasn't taken the same losses that I've taken. I've, um, you know, really, you know, felt some pain when it was unnecessary to feel pain. But I've also felt great elation from growth when the market didn't grow in the same way, right? Um, so there's two sides to it. And ultimately, this argument is that, like, hey, the downside is actually going to hold you back more uh, than you feel like it ultimately is. Now, does this mean that I buy no individual stocks? No, it does not, right? But Buying individual stocks is a small portion of what I do investing wise, right? Um, if I could put a percentage on the amount of uh, single stock buying that I do relative to uh, index fund purchases, I mean, index funds are at least 90% of my portfolio. Like it's just, it's outrageous. The um, you know level of my portfolio, it's just index funds. It's boring, right? But you pour money into it month after month after month, you make reliable returns over long periods of time you pay lower fees, right? Uh, you don't get near as much volatility. Uh, now, that's not to say I'm looking for less volatility necessarily, but um, let's say you have an actively managed small cap fund versus an index small cap fund. I would guess that the index small cap fund has lower volatility over a long period of time. So um, nonetheless, I believe in this and the statistics show it. Uh, and I also believe in the fact that we are not always rational. And that there are very, very smart people out there. Um, and all of these smart people are fighting against each other. Uh, and then you just have to ask yourself, and especially if you're a beginning investor, um, I implore you to ask yourself this question. Am I smarter investing wise? Do I know more than the average person who works on Wall Street? Not the best person, not the worst person, the average person right? Because if you think that you're better than the average person that works on Wall Street, uh, then presumably, right, you should be able to make better than average returns, right? Uh, but even that is not a question that can reliably answer whether or not you're going to be able to beat an index because you see these hedge fund managers who are likely uh, top of the top in what they do um, because Buffett let, you know, them choose a, a you know, five, amazing hedge funds to, to beat the, the market over some period of time, uh, over that 10 year period. And they couldn't do it. Right. So even the best of the best, not just the average, even the best of the best, uh, tend to fall short. Uh, and so that just leads you into this, um, you know, this boring place, right. It leaves you in this boring place of investing in index funds, investing in low cost funds. Um, I know it's boring. I, I know it, uh, is not fun. I know you feel like you need to be in the game. You need to be on Robinhood. You need to be buying GameStop when 
uh, you know, the meme stock craze was going on. You need to be buying Tesla when Tesla's popping. You need to be, but ultimately, over long periods of time, if you just want to know what works, you want to know statistically, mathematically, what's going to make you the best returns. I mean, just it's going to be index funds, right? It's going to be buying a diversified index fund uh, or, you know, group of index funds. And that's what I do, right? I'm not just buying an S&P 500, right? There is still work that you can do um, to, you know, diversify out further uh, and to hedge your risks among uh, the index funds that you buy. So for instance, I hold index funds of different size uh, stocks. So I'm holding the S&P 500, I'm holding mid caps, I'm holding small caps. Um, I'm holding both growth and value within those, right? Um, I'm holding international developed markets, emerging markets, things like that, right? So I don't just have this direct correlation between everything that I'm investing in that um, maybe sometimes, you know, some of those are going to lag relative to others, but other times you're going to see some that outperform relative to others, and that'll be beneficial uh, to you. So just keep that in mind as you invest. You can invest uh, however you choose to. I'm just telling you what works. And if you are somebody who is just beginning, um, I really, really, really implore you, um, find an index fund, find an S&P 500, find uh, a total stock market, whatever, and start putting money away into that. All right. And as you learn more, if you want to get more advanced or more sophisticated or whatever, then by all means do so. Just know that on average, getting more advanced, getting more sophisticated, doing more uh, is going to lead you to less uh, than just being boring and continuing to put money away into that thing. All right. Um, I mean, this is just a, a story that is um, just told over and over and over again, that people get wealthy by just simply investing, right? Uh, and not necessarily being the smartest investors, but putting money away into index funds, putting money away into things that are diversified and reliable, uh, and then just doing so aggressively, putting money away aggressively, and then actually having money later on, being wealthy um, and having money to live their lives on uh, in retirement or, um, you know, to live out their dreams, doing whatever it may ultimately uh, be. So what are you better off doing? You're better off buying an index fund. Um, and just if you're ever, you know, sitting and you get the itch, you know, to go buy some stocks, well, likely you're going to try to be speculative anyway, right? Most people who are going out and trying to buy stocks aren't doing all their research like they should. They're not um, looking into companies in the way that they should. And what have I told you? If you have more than $10,000 invested uh, in index funds or in uh, diversified mutual funds uh, or ETFs, then you can put, you know, five, no more than 10% of your portfolio into like speculative assets. I've talked about, you know, Bitcoin or gold or, you know, whatever, right? Uh, you can by all means do that, right? But don't put away more money into that uh, then you would be willing to lose. And then, you know, maybe buy some individual stocks with that money uh, and have fun with it. But don't um, don't ever get caught up in the fact that uh, you won a few times, right? Uh, because just as quickly you can lose, right? And very few of us have uh, the temperament to continue going on um, when we're losing. And many of us do not have the temperament uh, of long-term buy and hold of individual stocks. It is hard to do. I've done it with some companies. It is gut wrenching from time to time. Um, there's companies that I sold that I shouldn't have. There's companies uh, that I bought that I shouldn't have. Uh, but these are lessons that you learn as an investor. And then ultimately, um, we just come back to the idea uh, that simple is better. Index funds are useful. Uh, and I just implore you to um, just continue pushing money into them over the long period of time because they will uh, grow as the economy grows. They will grow uh, as the underlying firms grow and you will be able uh, to reap the benefits of this uh, in your long-term financial life. So thanks for watching this video. If you could go down below, hit the big red subscribe button, like this video, leave me any feedback in the comments down below and I'll be sure to respond to anything you leave down there. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify podcasts, be sure to subscribe and leave me a review on either one of those platforms. Follow me on social media at MNO with Dylan. And that's really good supplemental materials to all the things I'm putting out in these long form episodes on YouTube and the podcast every single day. Then if you need somebody to help you to build a financial plan and keep you accountable to that plan over the long term, then I can do that. 
just DM me on any of the major social media sites and tell me that you were interested in financial coaching sessions. And you and I can begin working together, pushing towards your long-term financial goals and ultimately pushing you on towards long-term financial freedom, which is what I hope for every single individual who's watching or listening to this show on a day-to-day -day basis. So tune in tomorrow as I continue talking about personal finance topics that I think could be useful for you in your long-term financial journey. So thanks for tuning into this episode of Money's No Object. I'm your host, Dylan Howell. God bless.